Okay, hey, Michael J. Murphy. Who is Michael J. Murphy? He's the man that I'm here to talk about tonight. And I want to thank Kevin Murphy and his wife Maureen for the acres of information they emailed me about Michael. And a special guru, my Ogut Foster to Mickey Welch for a loan of some of Michael J. Jay's books. Now, I first came upon his writings when I was in Long Cash, and some of his stories have stayed with me until now. And these are stories collected from local people here in the shadow of Gullion. In the last few weeks, I've read another four of his works. He wrote six plays, ten books, was an accomplished poet, a photographer, and a broadcaster. And he was, as the title of this talk asserts, a Shanaki, a sage, and a citizen. Michael was born in Liverpool in 1913. He came to Drummond Tea in 1922 with his parents and family. And when he left school aged 14, he started work as a farm labourer. And he started to write down stories of the people he worked with. And it's that aspect of his work that I want to concentrate on this evening. Other aspects of his work deserve and would need more time than I can give them. For example, his photographs. Michael took thousands of photographs. He also developed them himself. Now, this was at a time, with some notable exceptions, when few photographers recorded the lives of poor people or working people, particularly in rural communities. So Michael's photos are a treasure trove of people at work, at play, relaxing in their homes or in the fields, in the orderliness of their lives. And his fiction, including his plays, his social commentary, which was published in many newspapers and periodicals, could also be the subject of talks like this one. And so would his correspondence with other writers, including Pater O'Donnell, Elizabeth Bowen, Cyril Cusack, Benedict Kiley, Brendan McMahon, Sam Hannah Bell, and James Plunkett. He was also a close friend of Kathleen Clark, widow of the 1916 leader Tom Clark. He was a man of progressive social views with a deep belief in social justice. And these core values, his core values, illuminate his writings, not in a dogmatic or a preachy way, but in the gentle little insights that he gives us as the stories unfold. And he also loved the landscape, particularly around Sleeve Gullion and Gullion itself. And his writings about the countryside around here are particularly uplifting lyrical and enchanting. But tonight, Mara Dirt May Bamachohan, I'm going to concentrate on the stories which Michael collected, especially here in South Armagh and in my own county of Antrim on Rathlin Island. And these were passed down through the generations by neighbours and friends. Now, let me say at this point, I have a huge interest in folklore and in our oral tradition. Many of our songs, our folk tales, our poems, particularly in the Gaelic tradition, have been kept alive because they are part of this living tradition. And I believe that these poems, these songs, these stories should be preserved, they should be inculcated into our education and other services, and they should be widely available to everyone. Michael has done a great service to Ireland and our understanding of ourselves, because he made a record of all this, of cost, customs, work practices, sayings, pastimes and traditions. And otherwise, there may be little trace of them this day, except in a very big, inaccurate way. And as I immersed myself over the last few weeks in Michael's work, I've come to respect him and to admire him greatly, and even more than I did when I first came across his writings. He devoted his life to the preservation of important, everyday, ordinary matters. 
and he presents us with an insight into the lived experience of people, mostly struggling to eke a living from the soil, often in difficult times. And he does not do this in a sentimental way. He lets the storytellers speak for themselves. From the early 1930s to his retirement in 1983, he gathered up and put together the largest collection of oral traditions in the English-speaking world. I'm going to say that again. He put together the largest collection of oral traditions in the English-speaking world. It's available in 150 volumes in the National Folklore Collection in University College, Dublin. He also compiled a glossary of Anglo-Irish speech. And for this alone, Michael J. Murphy deserves our everlasting gratitude. He clearly loved the words and the natural speech of the people. He puts it like this. Some of the diction of the people around the mountain, Sleep Gullion, may be classified as coarse and indelicate in their syntax and vernacular, imaginative and pithy. It's as Gaelic in structure today as their version of the English Elizabethan tongue which replaced the native language. And the influence of the old people he met around drum and tea gave him this appreciation of imaginative speech. And he continuously commends the language which he encountered around the firesides of drum and tea. Again, as he puts it, the quaint, frank and even graphic phrasing of the idiomatic speech of the old people contains both poetry and pathos, imagination and colouring, filtered and filtering through their words and sounds. And Kibnev deserves our support, and I really admire the work that they've been doing. They deserve our support for their efforts to compile an extensive and ongoing archive of people's memories and experiences here in South Armagh from the early 20th century until today. In West Belfast, there's a contemporary history project. Ducas is an oral history archive sited in the Falls Community Centre. They have interviewed over 350 local people who tell their own stories about growing up in that community since partition, including during the conflict. Ducas works in partnership with other groups like the Shankill Women's Partnership, EPIC, Charter NI, Belfast Taxis, Fela and Fubble, and Veterans for Peace. And a similar project is also working in the market area, the Market Social History Project. And I mention this just to commend and acknowledge their work and to note that the oral tradition and the recording of our social history continues. South Armagh, the Oriel, and especially the area of Slave Gullion are the main sources of Michael's work. He did spend some time in Glen Hull in the Spurren Mountains of Tyrone and on Rathlin Island. And he's published his stories from these places. Indeed, he travelled throughout Old Ulster. Now, Old Ulster is the nine counties plus Louth, from, from Rathlin to the Boyne, no border in between. Only Donegal misses out because, as Michael notes, Sean O'Hockig did sterling work there, especially in the Irish language tradition, and I am pleased to have known Sean and his work. So, from the Boyne to Rathlin, what a historic campus that is. For the last number of years, I have travelled to Rathlin Island for events organised by Frances Black and the Rise Foundation. The Rouse Foundation is dedicated to families of those who suffer from addiction. And Rathlin, which Conor Murphy, just to recognise this, when he was minister, helped to get the services that it requires. And that's why it's a thriving uh, community today, thanks to the work of Conor and to Stephen uh, McLeod. Anyway, it's a wonderful place. It's steeped in legends. And Michael visited there in the 1950s. And among the stories he recorded are stories about the Danes, about the Vikings, as well as Scots invaders, 
as well as Robert de Bruce's famous exile in the cave where he watched the spider which never gave up. So the notion of people in the 1950s talking about the Danes isn't unique to Rathlin. Some of Michael's stories from Gullion also have people remembering the Danes. And the Danes were here in the 9th century. So how could people here talk about something that happened in the 9th century? But when you think about it, it's not surprising. Carding Fjord, you can nearly see it from here. You, might be able, you probably can see it, I can't remember, from Gullion. And Lindugal at Anagasen was the site for the biggest Viking settlement on this island. And before the Danes, here in the shadow of Gullion, Cohullum played Hurlum, and the Fena and the Red Branch Knights sported and played. The Vikings couldn't conquer here. Here were the Gaelic clans of the Oriel resisted the Norman inv invaders, where the McMurphys fought against King William, where the United Irish Societies, the Ribbon Societies, and the Fenians organised. Now, in our own families, each of us, all of us, can go back centuries. For example, I can easily go back 60 years. I mightn't look it, but that's what I can do. I can go back 60 years. My parents can go back 30 years before that. Their parents can go back another 30 years, and so on. And before you know it, you're back to the time up in Gartamoor. The Great Hunger. And when Michael was collecting his stories, the Great Hunger was within living memory of the people who spoke to him. So it's little surprise that people of that generation spoke about this and told stories about the Vikings or Cromwellian soldiers or the Hound of Ulster as they had been told by the old people of their time. Remember I mentioned Robert de Bruce on Robert off Bruce on Rathlin. His brother Edward, who was crowned King of Ireland in Dundalk, was killed at the Battle of Fahard on the 14th of October 1318. That's not far from here. And Bridget, the great Celtic Irish woman, who was colonised as St. Bridget, only lived up the road from where Edward died. So if you travel from the Boyne to Rathlin Island or back the other way, particularly here in the shadow of Gullion, every stone, every rock has a story to tell. And in Michael's time, and notably before his time, people gathered to tell these stories and to listen to these stories. And most of the international folk tales were represented. Animal tales, tales of magic, Religious tales, romantic tales, jokes, anecdotes, hero tales, legends about Irish saints, stories about infamous or famous personalities and legends, both national, local and international, and tales about international events. And Michael chronicled and recorded, or Han wrote stories from people about customs and traditions about the Irish language, about smuggling, about thatching, roofing, shearing, about football, about cattle, chickens, geese, ducks, horses, carts, about road boiling, about turf, about birds, games, tricks, about cures and remedies, seaweed, grinding barley, thinning turnips, about potatoes or praties as he calls them, and lots about planting vegetables about holy wells, about moss rocks, about banshees, stories about love, stories about loss, stories about wakes, about warriors, about invaders, about witches, and the kayak, about fairies, and the shiogi, about horses, about tinkers, pobbies, about donkeys, about evictions and landlords, about the land, and about the devil. It just struck me when I was writing this. You never hear any talk these days about the devil <laughs> at all. Or about cranky priests who could put a curse on you. About marriage. 
about hell, about cows clap, and his writings about rattling, he adds to all these stories with stories about shipwrecks, about fishing, seals, parrots, the learning of English, and the decline of Irish. And his book, Rathlin, Island of Blood and Enchantment, the section on the Irish language is particularly poignant. And I believe it reflects the story of the decline of the language everywhere, including here in South Armagh. And he collected these stories in the summers. He went two years running in the summers of 53 and 54. And he credits his sources by name. And just so that I don't interrupt this narrative, I, I haven't done that. I've done it once or twice. So this is about the Irish language, and you, you, could, you could picture this anywhere. So Mickey Joe, Mickey Joe told them, going to school, it was all Irish among the children, and all English in the school. And coming home again, it was all Irish. My father had the Irish, and he used to go down to Paddy McCurdy's to, to be able to talk to him in Irish, and they'd talk all night in Irish. And Lizzie McCurdy, she should have it yet, for Paddy's not long dead, and they never talked any other way, only all the time in Irish to one another in the house and everywhere. And coming home from Mass with the old people, it was all Irish. They liked to speak it, but they would put you out or they would talk in Irish if they wanted to talk among themselves. So we only picked up a word or two of it. Another person told them, I heard them making a stick for a youngster at school who spoke Irish. The stick was called in Bata Score. Do you know this story? The children had to hang this round their necks, and if they were caught speaking Irish, a little slice was made on the, the stick so that the inspector would see it. And in this case, the gauges, they were the landlords on the uh, island, used to go to the school and mock the children, saying, you and your foreign gibberish. The gauges, incidentally, and this happened here as well, but particularly on Rathlin, they collected duty work. So a tenant had to give work, days work, for free. And they collected duty chickens or sheep off the, the tenants as well. I was told when Rathlin folk went to Bally Castle, the people there used to mock them for speaking Irish and that the people tried to learn as much English as they could. Another person, I heard it said that the United Irishmen could never get the society going on the island because the organiser they sent over couldn't speak Irish. How true that is, I wouldn't like to say. And Michael goes on to note that another source has Thomas Russell, the man from God knows where, learning Irish in order to organise in native speaking areas. And Thomas Russell spent some time in Rathal and I just did a little bit of research into this. And when he was secretary of the Linen Hall Library, he was taught Irish by a man called Patrick Lynch from Lachlan Island, which is now, you'll all know, in the news because of the film. He also photographed a pike that was found in a thatch on Rathlin, and he's a story about a man called William Curry from Rathlin at the Battle of Antrim. Now, some of the people he met also told him about the effects of the Great Hunger. And again, these stories reflect the reality of that time here in South Armagh and across this island. Again, it's Mickey Joe. Mickey Joe says, there were 1,200 people on this island. Now I think there are about 140. There are only about 45 families. About 300 people left in the one day. Whole families went. Many of them died at sea on the way over. I heard them talking about baking oaten bread and making up butter and cabbage leaves to take with them on the journey of the voyage to America. And a woman called Rosie McCurdy says, One day a ship took 400 people away. All for America, strange to say. And it took 18 or 19 weeks to make the voyage. 
My grandmother minds it, the famine. That means she remembers the famine. She had five or six sisters and two brothers, and they all went away. And a while a lot of them died on the boat on the way over. Michael goes on to say that he was told by a man, and I, I, I picked this up myself one time I was in the States, that many of the rattling immigrants went into ironworks in America, and most of them died off very quickly. And if you saw uh, the programme recently with Damien Dempsey, I think it was, when his people went, they were put into these like slave conditions and died. They couldn't stick the, the, the conditions. Another woman says, My grandmother was Bradley from County Derry that married into the island. They were all great musicians, she said, papers and fiddlers. And I heard her say that the year of the famine, all on the island would have died only for a ship that came ashore at the upper end and she had a cargo of flour and everyone got a good deal of it and that kept them alive that year. I thought this was very interesting. It was only on the wet ground, and the farmers among you will appreciate this, it was only on the wet ground, strange to say, that any potatoes were got at all. If the ground was any way dry, they all rotted away. I heard them tell that here. And some of the people, when they saw the blight on the top of the stalks, they started to pull them off to keep the blight from going down. But they'd be better off leaving it where it was, not touching it. The ones they'd done that with went quicker than ever. Some people plucked whole fields like that and lost the lot. And they went far worse. The way it was, whoever had any potatoes at all to bid them with their neighbours and with the rest of the people. And they pulled sea weed, sloak along the shore, and they boiled up with whatever potatoes they had, and they ate it. My father told me that no one had whole potatoes. They cut off the bad part, and they used the rest. But this was particularly uh, expressive. I heard they left Kalani. And they said all the dogs were on the cliffs crying. They had to leave the dogs behind. It was wild, they said. They went to Coleraine and walked barefoot from Bally Castle for meal. By the way, most of the people walked everywhere up until the invention of the bicycle. Some used the horse and cart or the donkey and cart, but it was not unusual for women to walk 10 miles or more to the market. On a little sort of a side, they used to put shoes on geese who had to walk long distance. And they did this by making the geese walk through tar and then over sand, and this formed little shoes or little boots. And walking from here to Dundalk wasn't unusual, or walking from here to Newry wasn't unusual. And lots of Michael's stories, and I think these are the really uh, whimsical ones, is when he's walking along a road and he meets somebody. He meets a tramp. He meets a woman. And they just have a chat. And it's the most ordinary little thing. But most of it was done either by him on his bike or by him wandering about the place. Now, he says that he got in at the death of this way of life. And he gives great credit to his wife, Alice, who he married in 1945, and they had four children, Patrick, Michael, Peter, and Winifred, and Mara Dirt, uh, Kevin, uh, Winifred, and Shaw, and Ked Falsha wrote, you're very welcome here and your family uh, with us this evening. And Dallas encouraged Michael in his work. In fact, Kevin Murphy credits Alice with opening Michael's vision and his narratives to the sensuality and the sexuality of women, as well as the lore and the mysteries of childbirth and pregnancy. Alice and, his, and their family accompanied Michael to Tyrone for a period he chronicled folklore from that region and also in County Down. But his heart was never far from Sleeve Gullion. And he notes that this mystic mountain, this magical mountain, was a magnet for the likes of Maud Gone McBride, 
Alice Milligan, W.B. Yeats, George Moore and A.E. Maud Gaughan, in fact, took part in an early Sinn Féin meeting on top of Sleeve Gullion. Standish O'Grady described Sleeve Gullion as the mountain of mystery. And before their time, in 1744, Seamus Moore McMurphy hosted a vast meeting on Sleeve Gullion to rouse the people against English rule. And myself and Tom Hardney used to make early morning trips up Gullion many, many moons ago. And one Saturday morning, we were accompanied by the late Jim McAllister before heading on to Dublin. And Jim regaled us with tales of this community in which Coo the Red Branch Knights, Nathena, and others came to life. And these are the stories that Michael J. was steeped in. His paternal great grandfather, William Jordan of Tiffcrum, Fork Hill, was a Gaelic scribe and a minor Gaelic poet. He sp- sent 1,000 line poems to the Pope. Why he would ever think of doing that is beyond me, but there you go. <laughs> And these were acknowledged by the Pope's secretary. And he also set up a soup kitchen during the Great Hunger at what is now the Three Steps Public House in South Armagh. And this was in opposition to the soup kitchen of the Reverend Dr. Campbell, rector of Forkhill and Forkhill Village, because of course the Reverend was only giving out the soup for people who were prepared to give up their Irish names. And the brothers of William Jordan had a shop in Mill Street in Urie, and they helped to supply the soup kitchen. Michael Jell's mother was Mary Campbell from Drum and Tea. Her father was said to be the best cursor in South Armagh. He and her, and her mother, that's Michael Jell's granny, were native speakers. And Michael's mother was also a storyteller and a musician. She played in Bosca Kuehl. And her death in the same week as her daughter Bridget in 1947 was a huge blow to Michael and his family. His father influenced his development as a socialist Republican. Michael Sr. Mickey Bocht was a friend of both James Connolly and Jim Larkin. And he came from Mike. So the Larkins, the famous James Larkin, comes from this uh, community. And I, 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 I quote Kevin Murphy here a few times, but Michael Jay's father told Kevin Murphy, James Connolly had a great brain, but was a poor speaker. James Larkin was a great speaker, but he had no brains. <laughs> so Michael's father was a seaman. He worked and he travelled widely. He was a fluent speaker of Scots Gaelic, which he learned in the Scottish Highlands and in the Hebrides. He'd been to Tsarist Russia. He had worked for a period in the Mauritania. And all of this is the sort of the, the family setting in which Michael J. grew up. And he's obviously a man with a sense of himself and with a sense of the importance of his work. In the introduction to Ulster Folk of Field and Fireside, he writes, I know I have written one of the greatest, if not the greatest, stories ever to come out of Ulster. And I make that claim unblushingly. Apart from my journals, they represent the journal of a people, told by the people themselves for the first time and no doubt the last time. So he's not taking credit for himself, he's giving the credit to the storytellers. And there are lots of theories, why, why are, is there this sort of rich uh, wealth of stories in a relatively small area of southeast Ulster? And the fact is, this was, and it remains, uh, a district called the Oriel. And according to Padraigine Nihulahan, in her wonderful book, A Hidden Ulster People's Songs and Traditions of Oriel, and she commends and pays tribute to Megal in this book, and she says, Oriel is now a non-defined territory, roughly stretching from North Meath to North Louth 
and South Down, west to Kevin, Monaghan and South Armagh. And the song and literary tradition is mainly concentrated in South Armagh, North County Monaghan and the coastal Omeath area of the Cooley Peninsula in County Louth. And the poets and scribes of the area from the middle of the 17th century to the middle of the 19th century regarded themselves, even though some of them are in present-day Leinster, they all regarded themselves as being from Ulster. They spoke the dialect of Ulster, they cultivated Ulster literature. She goes on to make the point that the collecting, the stuff that Michael did in the early 20th century, is the continuation of a long manuscript and literary tradition that existed for centuries. This is the region where much of the heroic tales originate, the Ulster cycle. And the central story in that cycle is Tom Bohullion, the cattle raid of Cooley. And since the first millennium, this most famous of the early sagas and other stories were handed down orally and in manuscript. Now, the presence of the O'Neill family, who were the local chieftains, with castles in Glasdrummon in County Armagh and in uh, Dungooley in County Louth in the middle of the 15th century, and the many male and female monasteries from Armagh to Drahara, that all helped to cultivate the cultural life of the region. And then the success of plantations of Ulster dispossessed many of the native Irish who made their way to less fertile areas, including this one that we're in this evening. But while the development of Irish literature and music was arrested, it didn't die out. For example, within living memory, South Armagh, Farney and O'Meath have been Gaeltacht areas. The last known native Gaelic speaker in this general area was Mary Harvesey from Cronalig, who died in 1947. The last native Irish speaker in County Louth was Anna O'Hanlon from O'Meath, who died aged 96 in 1969. And the McCrinks family in Drummond T, Natty, Thomas, Jamie, Mickey, and their son, and Mickey's son, uh, Mick, were noted for their great songs, for their tunes, for their music. And Mickey died in 1945, and his son lived on until the 27th of February, 19. 77. And he was, according to Michael Jay, along with his sister, as he told, the last native Irish speaker in this entire area. So the last speaker, native speaker, only died here in 1977. Mary Nugent from Drummond T died in December 1948, and she helped Michael often with his Gaelic uh, pronunciations. She was one of his main sources. She was the last fluent native Irish speaker in Drummond Tea. And there were other native speakers in O'Meath, and they too kept the tradition alive. And they also gave Michael many of his stories. Now, Sleeve Gullion looms large in all his writings. In fact, one of his books, Sayings and Stories from Sleeve Gullion, it's sourced entirely in Drummond Tea, Jonesboro, Calivi. Mullabon, Fork Hill, Cross McLean, Fahard, and O'Meath. And some of the sources were Irish speakers, but even where they use English, the constructions are Irish language constructions. And some of them are, are quite funny. I, 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 I could give you a hundred of these, so I tried to pick out the ones that I thought were, that struck me. For example, two old men were in a graveyard at a funeral. And one of them's complaining, he's not well, he's no energy, he's sore all over, he's tired. And his companion says to him, so it's hardly worth your way going home. <laughs> a saying which described an old man courting a younger woman. Old courting is cold courting. Show me your ditches and I'll show you your neighbours. A good horse can speak for itself. <laughs> it's a sign of a good horse that can fart in the morning. 
And people who, you know, have an inflated sense of their own importance, you know, who are full of airs and graces, it was said of them, you think their dung wouldn't smell. And one day, a friend of mine from Cross, he was talking about somebody who was full of themselves. And this is the first time I ever heard the word dunkel. And for those of you who don't know, dunkel is a, a dung stack. And he said sarcastically to the guy he was talking about, every rooster has its own dunkel. <coughs> and a courtship which is doomed to end, they never piss in the one pole. So Michael's sayings and stories from Steve Gullion, it's filled with these expressions. And as I've said earlier, he, he believed in using local idioms instead of standard English. And in this way, he felt the authenticity of the story, and the storyteller was protected. And I agree. I remember when I was at St Mary's Grammar School, many moons ago, I rebelled against the efforts to teach us elocution. And I think that local dialects need encouraged and not destroyed. And Megal was also unapologetic about strong language as part of a story. He wrote, these tales were told by grown-ups for grown-ups, as most, most folk stories are. Strong language is part and parcel of the performance and could not be cut out without destroying the particular flavour of folk speech. Now, he actually published a collection of body tales called My Man Jack, and this is one of the books that Mickey Welch didn't lend me. And he published this after reading a book by a man called A Professor Vance Randolph, who put together a collection of folk, folk stories from uh, Arkansas. And Michael J. realized that he had similar stories. And his preface is very revealing. He writes, the traditional, now remember, this is a totally uneducated man in terms of school education, like, like Paddy Kavanagh. Right? He, 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 uh, and he was obviously a hugely literate and educated person, but in terms of the, the suppose, standards by which, 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 which are set. So this is what he says. The traditional intent of the body tale was to give healthy amusement and laughter in mixed company, and an honest expression of an impulse derived from human instinct. And much of the same impulse may be claimed for the pornographic, but there's a fundamental distinction between the two. The body tale is extrovert and outgoing, the other is introvert and sly. The body does not exult in the sexual content of its myths, the pornographic does nothing else. The body can uplift in its mirth, the other arouses a smirk of suppressed guilt and is solitary and bound to be degrading. And a sort of a little example of this, I don't know if this is an appropriate example because I didn't have this particular book. But he collected this story in Blackland in County Kevin. A woman was told by her doctor that she should not conceive again. That she could not conceive again because she would be signing her own death warrant. So she moved into her own room. The doctor advised her not to sleep with her husband. And she was in a separate room. And then one night she appeared at her husband's bed. And she said, I've come to sign my death warrant. <laughs> and he said, right, I have the pen in me hand. <laughs> <laughs> right, Michael was also a social campaigner. In particular, he raged against the hiring first. And both his parents were hired in Uri when they were 10 years old. And the stories that he heard from them, and particularly from his mummy, had a profound effect on him. His mother was paid 30 shillings for her first six months when she was 10. And later in life, she had a weak chest, which she said came from the continual weddings that she received while hired to farmers in County Down. So it's little wonder that during the 1930s, Michael campaigned against what he described as the slave market which caused so much hardship to the children of the rural poor. And in an article in Hibernia, he says, Can any city parent imagine having to take his boy or his girl 
into O'Connell Street in broad daylight to trade the labour of his offspring to some stranger for six months. Proper sleeping conditions, regular hours of work and sometimes decent food and surroundings are neglected. There are no half holidays, no bank holidays, no Sunday freedom. And I know there's inspectors, he writes, but anyone can drive a, co- a carriage and forth through an Act of Parliament. The system of hiring fares must be abolished. Fixed rates for wages for workers of respective ages and distinct capabilities can do much to sort this out, but why not eliminate that cattle fair atmosphere by providing farm workers exchanges similar to labour exchanges? Regular hours with an understanding regarding overtime when seasonal work is on, references similar to those required in other occupations, and an unreserved recognition of equality in common with other occupations is also required. So this is a man ahead of himself in terms of social justice. And he did regard for the pomposity and the bombacity and the hypocrisy of some church clerics. He was accused once of transgressing canon law because one of the main characters in one of his plays was an illegitimate girl and he portrayed her as being intelligent. He was threatened with excommunication, but he replied that he couldn't be excommunicated because as a socialist Republican, he was already excommunicated three times before. So I want to finish with two stories. One of Michael's, and I'll tell you, I I, I could give you 20 of his stories, but I want to finish with uh, one of them because it's one that was in the book, the, one of the two books I first read in Long Cash. And I've heard a few versions of this since, but basically it's about an old man and he lived alone with his son. And they got on very well until the young man got married and he brought home a wife. And the wife said about cleaning the place up and changing the furniture and rearranging things. And the old man never complained. And the woman never complained either. And then she gave birth to a son. And the house became stressful. And she said to her husband, look, you're going to have to move your dad out. We have our own family now. There's not much space. All he does is sit by the fire, smoking his pipe, spitting into the flames. That's not good for the child. That's no way to rear a child. But the son resisted. This became a great source of contention between them. And one day the wife says to him, either your father goes or I go. Me and the wee fella. So the son sat down with his father and he said to him, Da, you're going to have to go out on the road. Things are difficult here. And the father said, all right. But would you give me a blanket to cover myself? And the son said, no. You're going to have to make your own way. And just at that, the child who was lying in the cradle sat up, tore a blanket in half, and said to his father, Give that half to my grandfather, and I'll keep this other half until it's your time to go. (laughs) So I hope that uh, Michael would appreciate this next story. It's about my community in Bella Murphy. It's a metaphor for our relationship with Britain. It's appropriate to Brexit, all the rest of the stuff that's going on at this time. And for those of you who don't know, Bella Murphy is a housing estate in West Belfast that beat the British Army. And Michael and his wife Alice were forced out of their home here by the British Army and moved to Walterstown, Castle Bellingham, County Louth, where he lived on till his death in 1996. And I'm sorry I never met him, and I'm sorry I never met Alice. Anyway, back in Ballymurphy, we woke up one morning to find we were occupied by the British Army. And they took over our local church hall, our GA pitch, the local industrial estate, which was under community control. And they put our community 
under virtual curfew, and they did the same here. And like other Republican communities, the people of Ballymurphy never went to war. The war came to us, and the people responded in many ways. For example, the Brits used to saturate our streets with patrols which they called duck patrols. And the Ballymurphy women organised themselves into hand patrols, which accompanied the duck patrols, banging bin lids and pots and pans and haranguing the British soldiers. And remember, these are the so-called elites of the British Army, like the Parachute Regiment. And Father Des Wilson has noted they weren't used to be mocked by women. And the local people also took down street signs so that the soldiers who were strangers usually got lost. And one day there was an epidemic of patrols in the Murph, and they were obviously lost. Their backpack radios were blurring, there were helicopters in the sky, and through it all walked a wee Bella Murphy woman on her way to the shops. And she was stopped by a British Army officer. And he says, Mom, could you tell me where we are? And she said, Son, you're in Ireland. And he stepped back and he glared at her. And he pointed at the street up in front of him and he said, No, 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 no. Could you tell me where that street goes? And she said, Look, I've lived here all my life and I've never seen that street going anywhere. <laughs> And again, the British officer stepped away from her and he said, You Irish are very stupid. And the wee woman stopped, looked at him and said, Well, that may be, but we're not lost. <laughs> so, Shin Mamed, Shin Makokal, Kopla Fokal Mar, Mas a horse, Ogus Honor a horse, Ogus Kibnev a horse, or Megal J. Murphy. Goramogov, Goramogov.